Our scripture reading for this morning comes from Exodus chapter 22, verses 22 through 24, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, and I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. You shall not abuse any widow or orphan. If you do abuse them, when they cry out to me, I will surely heed their cry. My wrath will burn, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall become widows, and your children orphans. For our struggle is not against blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We give thanks for the word of God in scripture, for the word of God within us, and for the word of God among us. Will you pray with me? God of grace and love, Pour out upon us your spirit of wisdom as we hear the words that you have for us today. God, help us to not merely be hearers of your word, God, but doers. I pray that your word would push us to be people of grace and people of love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Holly. So I'll let you know right up front. It's not going to be a real fun sermon. And I've had a couple of those. My wife's warned me. She said, you need to get some peppy ones in there because you're getting a little dark. So um, Pastor Nikki has next Sunday, and she's talking about different atonement um, theories that are, you know, how does the cross come in and speak into our, our lives? So that one will be, I promise you next Sunday will be a lot more upbeat. Uh, So we're talking about something today that's a little bit difficult. I was trying to think about um, how to uh, explain this concept to you. So I'm going to begin with kind of a a story um, about Marjorie. Marge, um, as her Sunday school class called her, uh, Marge wasn't doing so well, but she, she seemed fine uh, to herself, but all of a sudden things started slipping a little bit. Um, and, and people started whispering, like, maybe there's some dementia going on here. They weren't quite sure what was going on. And uh, it, it got a little bit worse and a little worse until finally one day, um, Marge was pretty much stuck in bed and just comatose almost. So they ran her to the ER, got her in there, and found out she was severely dehydrated and probably for a month or better was suffering, for a couple months or better, was suffering from double pneumonia. Now the thing was, she never ran a fever, she never felt ill, but it was in her system just working away, tearing down uh, her health, slowly but surely. She got rehydrated, they started pumping her full of antibiotics and steroids, and she bounced back right away and was pretty much back to her old self. But this sickness was in her system, and it was infecting all sorts of things, and the only way you could see it was by the impact of it. Today we're talking about a a strange thing that we don't talk a whole lot about But honestly, a lot of Scripture is concerned with, and that's communal sin. Communal sin. Communal sin, uh, it's policies or practices in a culture or customs that produce or perpetuate inequalities, injustice, or harm in a community. There are these things underneath, and sometimes... Um, we can point them out and see them very clearly and say, oh, that's unjust, that's unfair. Other times, we might actually support or prop them up in our ignorance. There are these things that are, that are buried beneath that cause real harm, sometimes to ourselves, but certainly to the whole of our community. Uh, We're going to learn about what that looks like by looking at some symptoms or examples of. But one of the first ones I want to talk to you about comes from Scripture. In fact, uh, after um, Peter has the first uh, Christian sermon, um, 
after that, we see all these people begin coming to Christ, and then there's this issue that the disciples run into in Acts chapter 6, and it's an injustice issue that they have to deal with. It's one of the first things we see the church doing as far as ministry goes. Uh, Now, during those days when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists, that means the Romans, the Gentiles, uh, or Jews that had been living in that cultural way, complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. So these people are coming to faith, and the church is, uh, has a food bank, so to speak, is what the temple would do. Uh, some of the gifts to the temple and to the community, this was their social network to catch those who were vulnerable or had no means to care for themselves, and then they would distribute this food to help people out. And the, the Gentiles that are now coming to the Hebrew faith, because in these early days, they weren't distinguishing Christian from Hebrew. They were, they were Messianic Jews, would be a way of saying it. And they're receiving the Messiah, Jesus Christ, experiencing his grace and mercy in their lives. And yet, when they go to be ministered to, they're getting the short end of the stick because they're not originally a part of the community. So you can imagine how that might happen. They don't know the people, right? They aren't as known to them. So the disciples discuss it and say, look, we need, to, we need to focus on leadership, so we need to appoint somebody, and they appoint somebody named Stephen. Now, Stephen's a Gentile name. So they appoint someone who is part of that community to ensure that they are being uh, just with how they distribute the food. Nobody intended... To, to shortchange these people they were serving. No one meant to slight them, but somehow it was cooked into the system that these people were not receiving what they should from the ministry offered. So communal sin gets in there and it has this larger impact. And it's an uncomfortable thing for us to talk about because... I know a lot of, unfortunately, I'll say it seriously, unfortunately, a lot of it has been politicized. But when we look at our roots as Christians, social justice is at the heart of Scripture. If you look back at the minor prophets, each one came, nearly all of them came, because of a social justice issue. And this passage that we've lifted up from Exodus shows that God's heart is furious when the disadvantaged get taken advantage of or are neglected. And so in different seasons of Israel and Judah's life, the two tribes, the two nations, these prophets would come and call this sickness out and point it out to them. Sometimes it was very often uh, visible, Other times, not so much. But they would come and they would call it out. One of the things that um, we are still seeing the ramifications of is uh, during some of the major revivals at the turn of the century, there was a huge emphasis on personal sin. Which, obviously, that is a part of the gospel, and it's probably the gospel you've heard over and over again. So some of this is going to sound kind of strange and maybe even uncomfortable. Um, But Jesus came to bring the kingdom of God. Our personal salvation is a stepping stone to the prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It, It is to be the beginning of the transformation of a community around us. A community that reflects uh, that first sermon that Peter preached when he uh, quotes Joel and says, In those days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, male and female alike, slave and free. And 
it's this image that all people will have equal value. And that through the coming of the Spirit, there will be convicted hearts that deal with their own personal junk, but then go on and be transformative in their communities. Challenging, like Jesus did, authorities who press others down. Or wrongful ways of thinking and being. And so we do have this all around us. Um, you can agree or disagree with my list, but you know we have gerrymandering, we have bus routes, we have interstate systems, hiring and pay gap disparities, policies that favor corporations over individuals' dignity. Uh, we have pumpkin spice that's only available in the fall. We just got all these horrible injustices, right? Why can't it be a year-round thing? But these things that get, that get in our system, and you know, a lot of times the people moving these things aren't even aware. But we can see it in the symptoms that present themselves, and, and if we're wise, we rush to the ER, we rush to the doctor, we go to God on our knees, and we seek what is going on on here. So I, I know that, and you're going to think I'm being political, I'm not, I'm being Christian. Systemic racism is an issue. And this is the sort of thing that we're called as Christians to draw out, to call out. Um, a, a recent study showed, it was a 2020 study, it showed that for every uh, county that had 10%, now they, they studied, I think, um, it was over a thousand counties, I can't remember the exact number, I've got it somewhere in my notes if you want to know later, but um, for every county that had a, a black primary care physician, uh, up to 10%, of the, and one of the things is they found that in 50% of those a thousand or so, they didn't have an individual to represent in that county. But in the ones they were able to study with a black primary care physician, uh, the life expectancy gap between blacks and whites, which is six years, on average, uh, uh, black individuals die six years earlier than we do as white individuals. That gap closes by 1.6% for every 10% of a black. Simply a black physician there holding his brothers and sisters accountable, not because they're trying to do real harm. They aren't. We love our doctors. They sacrifice a lot to do the work they do. But there's something there. Our prisons are 38% white and 38% black. And then other minorities mixed in there. One of the ones that was astounding to me is uh, Native American population is 0.9% of the American population. They represent 2% of the prisoners. And what? How does that make any sense, right? The black population makes up 13% of the American population, but they make up 38% of those in prison. If systemic racism isn't a real thing, draw your own conclusion there. If it isn't cooked into the system, if there isn't communal sin skewing us at a large... And we, we should intuitively know this because it messes our lives up, doesn't it? Why on earth wouldn't it mess our systems up? We, we lost that, you know, in that turn... I went to that turn of the century where um, there was this strong emphasis on... On personal sin and there is a place and space for that but but I feel personally I feel um, that in a way the enemy has used that as a smokescreen to hide from us what we are supposed to be doing in a lot of ways so you know don't just believe my statistics you know remember what Abraham Lincoln said don't trust everything you read on the internet so make sure <laughs> Some of you are going, why is that funny? Well, you know, 
<laughs> All right. <laughs> Make sure the things that come before you that validate, that validate um, assumptions you already hold, that you double check them. I, I always do that. Don't just believe the things you see or hear that explain away something that makes you uncomfortable. Dig in and find out uh, what is going on. And you will see it everywhere. Uh, for those of Matrix fans, it's everywhere, you know. It's in the water we drink. It's in the systems that govern us. It's all around. Now, that's the heavy and the hard news, right? And, and I've got plenty of more statistics in here that um, would boggle your mind. I, since 1980, can you guess how uh, much our incarceration rate has risen? 400%. 400%. Um, we have a higher per capita incarceration rate than Russia or North Korea. Part of that is policy, but another part of it is something that a lot of us, and myself included for a very long time, uh, held as a very important value to be tough on crime. And so we vote for people who promise to be tough on crime when what they're really being tough on is not the systems that produce crime, which is where you can actually do some real change, to deal with mental illness, to deal with uh, poverty, to, to deal with food insecurities, to deal with addiction, and not ask our police officers to do all that, by the way, which is unfair. You know, there's this whole battle between Black Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter. They both matter, and they're both getting the raw end of the deal right now because we're asking our police to govern things that our systems ought to be taking care of. And then we're putting so much stress on them that it comes out at end times with some of them in very negative ways. Because we hold the value that we need to be tough on crime. We need to lock those people up. These are symptoms. Now, now, here's the good news. Here's the good news. We've been given the tools. And this church already has a heart. Now, don't hear it in a political term. Let's call it biblical justice. This church already has a heart for biblical justice. For meeting the needs of others. We see it in our support of Heart and House, our meals, a lot of our other projects that we engage in has this spirit about it. The fact that we're a church that says, hey, come as you are, stay as you are. You don't have to change to fit in here. It doesn't matter what your gender is, your color is, your orientation is, your identity is. Come and be here with us. Because we are creating a pocket, a space that is different from the world around us. Do we have problems here? You got me, so I'll tell you, you got at least one problem, <laughs> right? And then we can count all of us up and everybody that comes regularly. We got all those problems, right? But we have this same mind. The mind that was in Christ. So let us be a people. Let us be a people that digs deeper than the surface arguments the world wants to throw at us. Let us be a people that recognizes I have sin in my life, so there's probably messed up things in the systems around us that cause pain and hurt. Because I really don't want this passage to come about. Should I read that Exodus passage again? Oh my goodness. 
You shall not abuse any widow or orphan. If you do abuse them, when they cry out to me, I will surely heed their cry. My wrath will burn, and I will kill you with the sword. And your wives shall become widows and your children orphans. Wow. Right? God has a heart for the disadvantaged. And I thank you that you're a church that does as well. Let's continue to lean into that reality. And let us find those spaces in our hearts where maybe we need to grow a little bit as well. As we do so, we've prepared a call and response confessional. If you would like to join me in it, you are welcome to. God of justice, you repeatedly call us to action. Your word convicts us. Inaction is just as sinful as the wrong actions. Renew our passion for the downtrodden as we silently confess our sins to you now. Let us pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.